OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Today we're going to be talking about six instructional strategies to integrate with EdTech for any classroom setting. And I'm here with uh, Janelle McLaughlin and Shannon Moore, and I'm Dr. Matt Rhodes. We're going to introduce ourselves and then really jump into this. So here we go. And I'm a tech trainer and ed tech integrationist for the Consortium of Education and Career Network of North San Diego County. We have six adult schools within our consortium. Additionally, I work at San Diego State University and Concordia University, Irvine, working with new teacher candidates as well as, as doctoral students. And I hope that you can follow me um, on my social media at Matt Rhodes 1990 and check out my website. Good morning, everybody. I'm Janelle. Um, I'm actually coming to you from Indiana. So it's good afternoon from my state. Um, I'm an education consultant and previous teacher, although I say I'm still teaching, I'm just teaching adults. So I work with educators across our country um, and am also a, a speaker and author. So happy to be here. There's my website and my Twitter, and I always love connecting with new people. Hey, everybody, Shannon Moore. I am in Central California. I'm a teacher on special assignment in our HRD department in Visalia Unified School District. So I work primarily with new teachers and their mentors as they're moving through the induction process. Um, you know, we're kind of a uh, support all teachers uh, kind of department. And so love what we do. Excited to see who, you guys here today. Um, and really, uh, our next activity really is dependent upon you all and your cameras. So if you wouldn't mind turning your cameras on for a minute, if not, we'll go ahead and give you an alternate um, kind of, a, you know, uh, way to participate. Um, so what we'd like to do is really it's all about who is in our room, right? Because we can't really continue with this content unless we understand a little bit about who is in our room. And so what we're asking you guys to do, if you're, if you're comfortable, is to change your virtual background to a scene that means something to you or captures your mood. Um, if you are like, you know what, my computer is not allowing me to do that, that is fine too. Do us a favor and go to Google and search an image or a GIF and just add it to the chat um, for us. What is, what is a virtual background um, or an image rather that you know, su supports something you're, you're about, you're interested in, or captures your mood? So the way that you do that is if you go ahead and hover over the stop video icon at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a little carrot top pointing up. You'll click that carrot top. It'll go ahead and direct you to choose virtual background. And from there, you can choose one that's already preloaded, um, or you can go find an image on your uh, you know, desktop or your computer that represents. So we have Will in space. Um, love it, Will. Jamie, your background is so fun, so much fun. Uh, Janet, we have you at the Golden uh, Gate Bridge. It's awesome. Janelle's living in the beach, which is always fantastic. Uh, Blanc, I love the virtual filter you've added or the video filter with all the happy faces. Matt looks like he's in the mountains. It's okay, Patricia, totally fine. Um, Laura, we got you in a library, I'm guessing. Um, and so if anybody's comfortable at this point, uh, if you'd like to go ahead and wouldn't mind unmuting and just kind of share a little bit about what your virtual, virtual background or video filter means to you, we would love to hear it. I can share that um, the you, this library is this is actually the Stockholm City Library. It's a very famous rotunda they have. And I have the privilege of living there in Stockholm briefly, so it's really meaningful to me. I love libraries and reading. Yeah, I feel you. Libraries are the absolute best. It's just something about the smell, right? That smell takes you to a place that just warms your heart. Um, Thank you for sharing, Laura. That's awesome. Anybody else want to share what their video background or image? Or filter Jamie, thank you. Sure, I I put as many things that that I love in the background. <laughs> so I've got hummingbird and a raccoon and plants and and then I'm lighthearted learning. So that's why it's laugh and learn on the pillow. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. Raccoons, huh? You like raccoons? What is it about raccoons that make your heart happy? 
Uh, well, uh, they used to, uh, my mom and dad lived in Oregon and they would come and, and, and feed it, uh, the dog kibble and they were just, oh. they just, I love their little hands. I know people consider them to be pests, but I just think they're adorable. I think they're cute too. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else? I'll go. Thank you. Lo okay. Thank you, Blanca. And then we'll shoot over to Lois. Okay. Uh, well, I, I probably should have put a, a rainy day uh, background. Uh, you know, I live in Central California and it's been so dry, even though it's, you know, not even spring yet, but it's raining today. So that is fantastic. So it makes me happy. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. What part of Central California? Uh, Wasco. Oh, cool. So not far, not far from me. Right on. Thank you. Lois, what about you? Oh, very simply, um, I just love gardening, but um, most of the time it is, seems to be a state of weeds. Notice the background there, it's <laughs> all over the place, but it delights me. And being here at, for all this training is um, just like that. You gotta pick the bouquet. In this case, this crazy little thing that's on my head, you <laughs> pick what um, enriches, enhances and delights your life. So. Uh, and then some of those things in the background, you know, what seems like weeds right now becomes, I can navigate later and I'll be able yes. to understand how to use that. So I want to thank you for doing these presentations. And um, I, I just like to hide behind not having the video on. So I'll see That's you fine. later. <laughs> That's fine. Thank you guys so much for those of you guys that took the time to turn your video on and play along with us. We really appreciate it. You know how it is like, a lot it's nice to see people's faces um so we'll leave that up to you we're all adults if you'd like to leave your video on by all means if not that's fine too thank you so much um so i'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to my friend matt again i'll pop the um slide deck today's slide deck in the chat so if you want to grab that you can kind of follow along uh, and click on the clickable links that exist thank you that was all fantastic seeing everyone's backdrop it just shows kind of how everyone's mood is or you know what they're proud of it's a good social emotional learning icebreaker to start your lessons if they're synchronous online or um, you can even do it in person with google slides and i'm going to talk a little bit about a strategy that you can do that later on in our presentation today but really we we got together shannon janelle and i um just under this this idea and philosophy that really um as a result of the last couple of years um, that Pandora's box has been opened and instruction has no boundaries. And that's our philosophy. And we're, our goal is to create a number of strategies that can be utilized in any sort of educational setting, whether you're in person, online, in a blended um, type um, instructional model. Our goal is to develop strategies that can go align with a lot of various tools um, to amplify student learning. And we are also um, in the works of creating a toolkit in the form of a book where we share all these various strategies that can be used in any sort of educational setting. And our goal is to have research driven and teacher driven strategies that can be utilized in any of these um, instructional settings because we feel like that's the future. And specifically for you know higher education and adult education, we want to provide choices for our students in. I think this all rests under the equity argument that you want to provide these choices for our students to meet our students where they're at, especially as adult learners. And um, we feel that these strategies can help um, teachers in our um, consortium, whether it's in adult education or within uh, K-12 or higher ed, because we want to provide our choices um, to students for um, these equitable learning environments. So, um, I'm gonna have it move over to our first strategy, um, concept mapping, and Shannon, take us away. Thanks so much, Matt. And one thing, last thing before we move into all of these. So the way that we've structured today's um, kind of presentation, uh, we've taken elements from each of the chapters. You know, Matt mentioned we were writing a book, we're putting these tools into a book. And today is not a pitch for us to like, you know, buy our book. That's not our point. Our point today, though, is to support everybody with some concrete tools that would be effective in various um, instructional areas uh, across, you know, the classroom. So each of these concepts or these um, ideas are presented uh, in each uh, individual chapter. So we'll kind of go through it in that way. Thank you, Jill. Thank you for that. For that. We'll go ahead and take that note. 
So first and foremost, um, we're talking about engagement. Now, engagement is one of those things that, you know, you, you Google that and there's a thousand things that come up, right? How do I engage my students? Why are students not engaged is probably what you're going to see lately with the pandemic education. But what we've striven to do is we've, we, we really have tried to incorporate um, a bunch of different engagement structures that would work in both, you know, in-person, virtual, blended. But one particular that has really proven to be effective is the idea of concept mapping. And concept maps, uh, you know, essentially in a nutshell, they are visual representations of information. If you wouldn't mind, um, you know, since we can't really see your faces, if you'd go ahead and open the chat and maybe just give us some insight. Do you use concept mapping in, you know, working with, with the students that you work with or the educators that you work with? Have concept maps been a thing that you are familiar with? Just pop it in the chat like, yes, no, maybe I have, I need to know more information. Um, and we'll kind of go through and show you some examples. But really the goal of a concept map, thank you, Kathleen. The goal of a concept map is most often they're used for um, study strategies or a way to take higher level concepts and break them into smaller manageable pieces. Um, and so that the individual who's using the concept map can consume that information. And it looks a bunch of different ways. There's no one, one right way to do it. Uh, we're going to show you kind of a, a couple, but the goal really is to take those big concepts, break them down into smaller concepts so they're manageable, but that also also we can make meaningful connections to the concepts, right? Um, in other words, knowing the big picture makes details more significant and easier to remember. So we're going to go ahead and dive in. Um, it looks like we have some, those of us who have used concept maps, um, Jamie gave a really great example of pre-writing tasks to educators, um, KWL charts for sure, comparison circles, pros and cons columns, thank you. Um, so let's jump in and see what else we can do with these. So like I mentioned, you have some options here. Uh, the goal here is to break large concepts into smaller ones. Um, sometimes you know, we use concept maps to identify how concepts relate. Uh, oftentimes, I've worked with educators who've used concept maps for vocabulary development. Um, and then there's that element of visual note taking. All of us as educators can agree that no student is the same, right? Everybody brings different skill sets, different abilities, different learning styles to the table. Uh, and what that means is us as individuals have to learn how to, as educators, we have to learn how to adapt to the individual learning style. Now, for me growing up, you know, concept maps uh, usually took like the form of a brainstorm, right? Where you wrote a, a, a topic in the middle and then you kind of branched out, right? And it helped kind of develop my writing or it helped um, un me understand like concepts in science, whatever it may be. Um, but it goes beyond just the typical web, right? The brainstorming web. Um, oftentimes I mentioned that vocabulary development uh, Frayer models are fantastic for vocabulary development, and some people think, oh, it's just so simple. But when we're talking with those who are um, maybe have some language acquisition barriers, Frayer models are excellent because it asks them to dive in and really think about the individual vocabulary word in a way that is meaningful to them, to them, right? Thank you, Kathleen. Absolutely, right? Sparks a little bit. Um, the one that I am really playing with a lot with my educators that I'm supporting these days is this idea of visual note taking, right? Or sketch noting, some people try to call, like to call it. Um, and what it does is it allows those students, and I always give options, right? Traditional note taking or sketch noting, but I do explicitly teach both. But it allows those students who don't, can't quite wrap their mind around a, a concept um, using just, you know, words to um, kind of fill in those blanks and make those connections using images, right? So it, it, it lends to a different part of the brain. It helps encourage or, and it also empowers, right? Because it gives those who are more visual learners the opportunity to exemplify their learning in a way that's a little bit different. So I'm a big fan of always providing a variety of techniques. Some ways to, to use this are some, rather some ed tech strategies that you can incorporate. Um, I don't know if you've heard of wiser.me. Wiser.me is a little different. It's not necessarily a concept mapping platform, but what it does include is a variety of already interactive digital um, worksheets. So if you're interested in um, concept mapping, you can go here amongst other things and you can identify already pre-made worksheets that have concept maps built into them, right? So the students can then 
engage digitally rather than do it by hand. I'm also a huge fan of using Pear Deck. Uh, maybe you use Nearpod. It's an interactive slide uh, deck kind of add-on. And you can integrate concept maps like say, I uh, saw so earlier like a comparison contrast of Venn diagram. You can implement that in the back and the students can in real time uh, add to their notes to it. And you as an educator can see kind of the backside of it. Um, Control Alt Achieve, it's a wonderful blog. I'll go ahead and pop this in the chat so you guys can peruse. Um, but Control Alt Achieve has 21 interactive Pear Deck templates that allows you to kind of, first and foremost, it shows you how to use Pear Deck. But then it allows you to kind of go through and see, you know, here is draw two things you already know about today's topic. So they have lead-ins, they have in the middle of the lesson, they have, um, you know, post-lesson kind of reflection pieces. And you really could use these as an opportunity to, you know, frame some of the information that you're presenting to your students or when you're working with educators. Um, so I'm going to pop this blog in the chat for you guys to peruse. Pear Deck's a wonderful thing, and there's a lot of free templates. The next one um, that I wanted to kind of show you is some of us are Microsoft and not Google, um, you know, districts. And so Microsoft OneNote. Uh, has wonderful op options for not just taking notes like via text or typing, but you can actually draw in OneNote. So if you're a Microsoft district, what I've done here, if you clicked on the OneNote logo, is you can see kind of the template of how to like create drawings in OneNote, um, as well as some like a sample like here, if you guys were going to go ahead and draw the water cycle, um, how they could go about doing that. So there's another example. And the last piece I <laughs> wanted to show you was Miro. Okay, and Miro is not one that's often heard of, um, but it's one that I've come across a few times. And the cool thing about Miro is once you start a, um, you know, an account, it's, it's a single sign on with Google or Microsoft. Once you start your account, you have the opportunity then instead of creating concept maps from like just blank template or platform, you can go ahead and see all of the different types of brainstorming and ideation pieces that they offer. And it's a matter of just like, clicking and finding. So, um, you know, here's like a concept map. Here's another way, a mind map. You can see it like big topic to, to small. Um, just another, you know, resource for you guys to maybe think about um, when you're talking about, you know, concepts that are big. The five whys is one that I always like to use. Um, it allows you to um, really kind of take a concept and really dig deeper. Uh, the five whys, if you're not familiar with it, the concept is ask why five times, right? It helps them develop from like a general statement to a more specific idea. Um, thank you guys so much for the insight on that. So those are the couple pieces. Um, I encourage you again, please click our slide deck. There's a bunch of link of our clickable links there um, and you can ask the, access that for yourself. Oh, one last thing. Miro allows you to make teams. So if you have a team of teachers that you're working together with, you guys could collectively create concept maps that you then could put in your team folder and everybody can access. So uh, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on over to Matt. Yeah, so let's talk about another really great strategy that can be utilized in any sort of um, classroom today that we're in. This one is Jigsaw. Jigsaw can be used for so many different things, and it's a great way also to differentiate um, the instruction for your students. And what I've liked to do it a lot in the past is with reading comprehension with um, multilingual learners. And I really enjoy doing it on Google Slides, um, but you can also do it on Jamboard. And you can do it also on Pear Deck and Nearpod in asynchronous mode. And really the instructional uses, um, you can focus on annotation, paraphrasing. Um, you could have students read a passage together or read part of a passage together. Um, you can front load using Jigsaw where you essentially provide, um, you know, two to four groups with different types of text or problems and then have them come together and have a discussion based on the themes that they found relating to that, um, the problems they were solving or maybe they're reading um, each part of a story or of a passage and they can come together and, and develop those themes. Um, and it can also be um, opportunities for a mentor text dissection. So you could have various groups look at different parts of a essay or text um, 
and then you could have them analyze it and then bring them together for further discussion. Um, and really one of the um, best ways that I like to do it, like I mentioned, is with, um, yeah, Jigsaw I use often in ELA. So when I, whenever I'm teaching um, English, um, so reading comprehension, uh, yeah, paired reading, yeah, perfect, yeah. So what I would do is I have, for example, on my slide right here, um, it is the um, biggest pumpkin and um, and this is a, a news ELA. So I generally take a news ELA article and I make it different Lexile levels based on where my students are at. So this one is at uh, 390L and this is essentially for one of my lower group of readers. And then group number, um, if we go to the next group, it is slide number, um, the Jigsaw 2, they're at 560 level. So that's my medium group. And it's the same article that the other students are reading. Um, and then so on for the third group, it's at the higher level. But they're reading the same article and they're analyzing it as well. Generally I like to give them a paraphrase or um, a annotation guideline that they use. So um, as you can see, each group has a different lexile they're reading it and this can be done in breakout rooms whether you're online or if you're in person you have them in groups in the class um, you know two to three students generally was is what I like or you could have them up to four um, and you can make as many of these groups as you want and what I generally like to do is if Shannon you can click on right that link right there oops yep so at the very end I like to have for reading comprehension is for each student to um, fill out a document like this and they do a collaborative summary and then they look at various types of key details that they're able to get from the various groups and then you know come together and discuss it so um, it's a really um, I think easy strategy um, the number of protocols um, that are required so you go to the next slide um, so I provide all the steps here for you and this is for online um, and in person, I talk about breakout rooms and groups that you can have, and I provide um, each of these seven steps as well as a video. Um, it is um, a strategy that you can use really sort of any sort of content. Um, so what I like to do is <clears throat> I have, for example, when I get an assignment on say Google Classroom or Canvas, um, I have the assignment, I can, you can assign on Canvas or Google Classroom to various groups of students. So I create multiple assignments and I deliver them to the various groups of students. Um, that way it's easier. Um, or for example, you can create one slide deck and you can divide up for each of the levels um, like I did here, but you could have all the levels there, but you don't say what the, the level is to the students. You could say, you know, slide number two and uh, three is going to be group number one, and then slide number four and five is going to be group number two, and so on. You can do that as well, and just give them that link um, directly through if you're on online through Zoom or whether you're um, delivering it on Canvas or Google Classroom or sending it via like an email or 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 whatnot. So that's generally um, what I like to do for Jigsaw and. To really uh, just fun, engaging, and you can do it quite often. Um, you can do it um, a lot for independent practice, and it can be used for assessments as well. By the way, um, if you want to do it in a in a team based assessment, so there's a lot of different things that you can do here. Jamie, did that answer your question, or did you want to maybe clarify and and dive in deep? I, I was thinking that maybe I should read through the instructions. I, do, I think I do it a little bit differently, but I was just curious about with the summary, whether you, because you want them to actually type on the Google Doc and not necessarily collaborate because that moves the things around. Um, uh, that's what I was, I was just so checking in. Generally, yeah. So if it's um, for each of those slides, uh, slide decks, they're given one document and that team is focused on that one document. And then everyone else has their own document. So each group has their own document that they're working on. Got it. 
And I've also done it where we've put the like a Google Doc document we've shown, um, we put it on a Google slide. So turn the slide eight and a half by 11 by going to file page setup. So it's like a normal paper and each group then is hanging out in the same slide deck, um, but they get their own individual one. And then they can have a gallery view of what a gallery walk of whatever has mm -hmm. been going on, which is. Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. Great idea. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Oops. Next up, you get to hear from me again, um, and then we'll pass it over to Janelle. But um, this next one we're kind of looking at, we're moving into, um, you know, when we, as we're talking about 21st century skills, and I heard that those, I saw that those were mentioned in the chat, right? One of those aspects is this idea of inquiry or critical thinking, right? And so there are so many different ways we could approach inquiry and critical thinking in our classroom. And oftentimes, if I'm being honest, I think that that is one of the areas that my students may struggle a little bit um, on because oftentimes it does require them to get minimal instruction um, before they dive in and start to figure you know, concepts out and ideas out, come to their own conclusions on their own, which for my students um, and the teachers that I work with, sometimes that's a little scary, right? Because we're so conditioned to get the right answer. Um, and so one way that we feel is a little less intimidating is this idea of a web quest or a digital scavenger hunt. You hear that, right? And, and immediately when I hear web quest or even digital scavenger hunt, I'm brought back to when I was a kid, right? And we would go on scavenger hunts or we would do scavenger hunts in the classroom. And that in and of itself, like gets me excited, right? Because we get to be the detectives for the day. And so that's kind of what I have seen, um, you know, my students and, and the educators I work with kind of, um, they've kind of jumped on that idea. One of, let me just preface, you know, this by saying one of the reasons why I think some individuals uh, kind of shy away from using web quests or digital scavenger hunts in their classrooms is because it's a lot of work. But hopefully by the end of this, you'll have a few more tools in your tool belt to be able to um, implement these without having to recreate the wheel. Um, so let's talk about these digital digital scavenger hunts, right? Um, in a nutshell, you can see there that the point is it, it requires students to follow a set of directions and procedures to ultimately gather evidence uh, to solve a problem uh, or, and then ultimately create a student work product that highlights their findings. So it's beyond just the read this, respond this way, right? This allows them to really investigate and dive in and use those research-based skills um, to take concepts, synthesize them, and then ultimately come up with an understanding of, you know, the findings and, and the material. And hopefully then, you know, the next step would be for, for them to share out somehow. Um, both strategies like do involve, uh, you know, do involve the students kind of following, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a process, right? So the teacher has to like choose the topic and then they have to include elements to, um, you know, videos, photos, websites, podcasts that allow the students the resources and the materials so that they can dive deeply in and then ultimately kind of come to their own conclusions. Um, here, this little graphic, you can see uh, that there are a variety of ways to use WebQuest in, in class. In fact, if you Googled WebQuest or digital scavenger hunt, uh, educators across the world have been so kind to share so much, uh, you know, information or different web quests they've created. Um, one of the reasons I love web quests so much beyond the fact that it's entertaining and engaging is it allows me to really, when I really want to flip my classroom, so have students kind of investigate and dive in, um, you know, they can either do it in class or before they come to class, right? Uh, depending on like what your, you know, focus is or the objective is of the activity. Um, and then, you know, say they do it outside of class and come to come to class with their findings, it allows then for the class to collaboratively engage with the, the you know, product that the students have created um, and dive a little bit deeper um, from a variety of perspectives. If you do it in class and then send them home to create the, the WebQuest finding um, or the product, it allows you as an educator to kind of guide them through that inquiry cycle. So when I start with web quests or digital scavenger hunts, I always start with doing the web quest and the scavenger hunt in class together. And then I send them out uh, and at home, they, they create like some sort of product because I want to guide them through those steps first. As we continue the class a little bit, um, you know, when we get further into the semester, I oftentimes will flip that and allow them to do the web quest at home and come to class with something or create the product in class the next day. Um, 
there's so much power here because it gives ownership to the students. It allows the students to kind of use those higher level order thinking skills to come up with an understanding and then you know you as a teacher uh, or can can support them if your educators are using this that is what i would encourage you to tell them really that that level of empowerment is high uh, high engagement high level of empowerment so um if you're going to create your own if you want to get crazy and create your own um also let me know in the chat if you have created your own web quest we'd love to we'd love to see where where we're at on different levels there's this wonderful web quest structure that was created by this uh, individual last name Dodge. Um, and he kind of goes through these are the different parts of a web quest that you can use um, to guide you as you're creating your own. For me, to be honest, it's a lot of time uh, to create your own web quest. And I don't have a lot of time. I don't know if I'm alone in that, but um, a lot of time is not time is not a luxury for me. And so what I've done is I've, I've linked a couple different um, websites here. We have some science web quests here. Um, web quests in science are wonderful because it kind of follows that similar like lab structure, um, you know, and asks them to dive in. Um, and then this other piece, this website I found is a variety of web quests that have been created by college students for elementary aged children. So, you know, if you're teaching adults potentially who are going to go on and, um, you know, be an educator or they're gonna work in a field where they're gonna have to like support others, um, this is a great kind of resource for them to see like what it could look like. Um, these are the reasons we use WebQuest kind of talks about that. I love them for preloading information as well when you're jumping into a unit, right? If you want them to dive into, you know, say I'm doing a unit on Shakespeare. I'm an English teacher by trade. Say I'm doing a unit on uh, one of Shakespeare's plays and I want, I don't want to spend a ton of class time like just lecturing about, you know, the age of you know the Elizabethan era or whatever, I can have them do a web quest to figure that stuff out. And we could even turn it into a jigsaw, uh, like Matt talked about, where they then can turn that around and teach the class based on their um, their you know integration. Um, this website here, questgarden.com, I'm going to show you just a little bit of what it is. It's kind of cool. So Quest Garden is a database where individuals have added web quests. So they collect web quests and they throw it up. So if you are saying uh, going to do a web, uh, web quest on angles, you can put in the free text search here, angles, press enter, and you'll see all of these different um, web quests that exist for angles, right? Um, and you can hit back. And that could be angles in math. It looks like we have some for English, like media bias, right? Um, additionally, the other cool thing about this is you could really kind of search based on curriculum and grade level. And that gives you like a matrix of web quests. So, say you wanna focus on professional skills, right? And specifically, you know, for adult learners, um, you would push search um, and it would go ahead and give you this matrix that you could then use by clicking through and, and maybe even build units, right? Um, throughout the course of your uh, experience or the student experience or the educator experience. So of course it's gonna take a while to load, um, but my encouragement to you is, I know sometimes these can be scary, but I, I encourage you, you know, we really are finding in the age of pandemic education as we are bridging like both in-person and virtual learning that um, giving over some ownership to learning really does reinforce um, you know, student learning in, in and of itself. So uh, don't be afraid to like give students something and hope for the best and then you can redirect along the way. Um, but it also will tell us a lot about you know, who the students are and what they, what they can do. Um, so, as you can see, you have your grade content areas, all of these different web quests, one to 49, give you some, some ideas, right, of how you could um, use them. So that is web quest. Um, and if you're gonna create your own, uh, Google, site, Google Sites is a great resource for that um, because you can just create a simple Google site um, to house all of the different, um, you know, the task and all of those um, kind of resources that they would use to complete the web quest. So uh, if you have questions at all, obviously, please, um, you know, don't hesitate to pop those in the chat as we're speaking. Uh, with that being said, thank you for your comment, Jamie. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to pass it over again, I guess, to Matt, and then we'll go to Janelle. I lied. I'm sorry. <laughs> so now we're going to talk about photo essay. And what I really like about this strategy is that we kind of already did a little bit of a preview of that at the beginning for that intro for that, um, that SEL activity. Um, so essentially what you can do photo essay is it allows students to utilize and illustrate using text, graphics, GIFs, even videos. Um, 
to create a um, snapshot of what they're learning. Um, you can even utilize photo essays at TikTok. Um, and there's a lot of different tools that you can do it on. Um, so I like to do it for um, instructional uses, for formative and substantive assessment. You can do this. You can do this for jigsaw. You can do it to activate prior knowledge at the beginning of a lesson. Um, you can do it for metacognition and reflection, and then also uh, social emotional learning. And I generally like to do it. The easiest way for me, I think, to deploy it is on Google Slides. You create a slideshow with everyone on it. Um, and I'm popping in that link right there if you um, want to check it out. And I made this slide um, editable uh, for everyone to access if they'd like. Fortunately, the prompt, um, this is about a story um, that we would read in class this one summer. And, um, you know, I would just say, you know, create a photo essay, you know, talking about like a character or event or a theme of the story. Um, and I, I chose on my slide specifically a the mentor text, um, and I would use that as the first example there. So, yes, I love the squirrel. And if you've read the story, it's a uh, story about um, having fun and leisure, but a lot of family drama takes place on that vacation in the summer. So um, I tried to illustrate that in that photo there. But um, generally, so I, I like to create just a simple slide deck um, on Google Slides and then sharing it to the class. It's um, everyone gets a slide. So if you notice, if you scroll down, Shannon on slide number four, um, everyone has a slide name. I tell the students, hey, go click on your slide after I give you the link, whether I'm sending it on Zoom or it's on Google Classroom or on Canvas and the student goes to it and then they complete the task there. And what I like to do thereafter, once the photo essays are done, and they can be done in pairs too, um, is for there to be a digital gallery walk. And then that can go into further discussion and move into the next part of our lesson. So um, it's a really fun strategy to utilize. And then Shannon, if you move on to the next slide, I describe the steps um, that I like to do uh, with the photo essay and it's uh just a something that really is fun and engaging for students and it's a great way for students to summarize what they're learning about or summarize how they're feeling and if um in the world that we live in having that snapshot of visuals um text and video that's a great way for students to you know illustrate whether they are understanding something or not and it's a great way for you to assess assess students yep I love that. Yeah, creativity and conciseness. All righty. Well, let's move on to the next piece and we'll move on to uh, Janelle. So you'll probably see a trend in a lot of what we're talking about today is focusing on those what what most people would call 21st century skills. And thank you, Jamie. Choice boards are one of my very favorite things, too, which is why I chose to get to talk about them. Um, I think in choice boards, though, we can foster even more than just creativity and innovation, which is what we were focusing on today. And just as Shannon and Matt were talking, I, I jotted down how choice was um, obvious or um, present in the strategies they talked about before. Like in WebQuest, choice was brought in by um, what product they chose to create to demonstrate their learning. Shannon mentioned that. Um, there's lots of choice in concept maps if you are allowing your learners to choose what kind of concept map fits their learning style best. Um, mine totally would be the um, brainstorming webs, just like that's what we, that's how I think. I'm not good at sketch noting. I would never choose that. I do it every once in a while because I think it's good to challenge and stretch, but I definitely think that um, offering choice is good because it's tapping into different types of learning. And then in Jigsaw, um, you can even offer the resources that students are reading on a choice board as well, if you weren't going by um, reading level. So obviously, if we're, if we're categor categorizing by reading level, we want our learners to read at the level that is best for them. But if it's not, and it's on topic or um, on sections, then you could also offer choice there. So anyway, choice boards are also called learning menus. Sometimes people call them think tac toes. Um, so you maybe have heard them referred to different ways or different um, titles, but they're really great for differentiating learning. 
Um, plus, it gives students choice, which increases their ownership. So another thing that is common in all of the strategies and the resources that we've shared today is that we really focus on the learner and we want everything to be as student driven as possible. And I remember somebody writing in the chat about um, scaffolding the learning and that's so important when we're trying to empower our students to be more um, student driven because they really haven't had that opportunity often in their learning careers. So sometimes we have to scaffold more than others to um, have them be comfortable with taking over. So in the choice, um, on the choice boards, it encourages our students to engage in that activity. Um, it will require them to explore, synthesize, or apply important content, depending on how we design those. Um, I already said this, but anytime we increase choice, we're going to increase engagement and ownership. So um, I like to use choice boards when we're introducing new content to preload that knowledge. Um, at the end of something to review the content, choice boards are great for that. One of, the, um, one of the teachers I've worked with, one of my favorite ones to see was the um, plainest, most boring looking choice board I've ever seen, but I also thought it was one of the most applicable. And she just took a Google Doc, um, she turned it landscape um, position, and it was just full of grids, I think maybe 15 to 20 squares on there. And what she did was color code the background of each square to be either blue, yellow, or white. And it was at the end of a math unit. And if it was yellow, it was optional, like reteaching the students could access the resources or the problems in that box if they weren't quite sure on it, on the topic concept, and they wanted a little extra practice. The blues um, were practice problems that everyone had to do. And the white was, I think, access just to notes. Um, I can't remember exactly what the white, but there was only one color that they had to do. And that's what she used as a check to make sure everybody was ready for the assessment was just the blue ones that they were doing. Um, so anyway, lots of different uses for them. I'm gonna show you a couple examples too, but my favorite part about them is to differentiate. Even if you're not differentiating by level, you're differentiating by content and learning styles. Um, so to empower and motivate our students, we can provide them with those choices as they complete activities and tasks within the classroom. So these are two of my favorites. The one is you can see why some people might call it a think tac toe. Um, the directions are actually cut off at the top, but this particular teacher had 20 points assigned to every box and her students had to accumulate 100 points in a week's time. Um, this was completely virtual but she gave them options on if they wanted to do things virtually or um, paper or pencil. And she even gave them options on how they were turning those in if they didn't want everything to be digital. So in other instances, when people use these tic-tac-toe choice boards, teachers might say, you've got to get just three in a row. So then how you, um, yeah, the color can be an issue. I like the symbols idea. That's great, Jamie. So this one, I'm not sure why she color-coded if it had any kind, of, um, any kind of reasoning in the one that's on the example here. And then the other one is, is completely split between the four Cs. So in this one, the students had to choose one from the communication column, one from collaboration, one critical thinking, and one creativity. Um, so both of these are actually from shakeuplearning.com. That's a fantastic resource. If you've never gone to that website, I will forewarn you that it's uh, a bit overwhelming. It's super text and graphic heavy. So what I like to use is the search bar at the top. So if you go to shakeuplearning.com and search in the search bar, just choice boards or learning menus, you'll find a lot of templates there available. Because just similar to the web quest, I don't like the design part of it because I don't have the time. So if I can find one that somebody's already designed and delete out content and put in my own, then I'm happy. Thanks, Shannon. Um, and then Pinterest, also similar in the search. If you just go to Pinterest and, and search choice boards or learning menus, you'll find a lot that are already created um, and you'll also find templates. Again, you can make your own, just like my math teacher friend that I coached, um, she just made her own with a plain Google Doc. Um, and that wouldn't have taken a lot of time to create other than filling in all of those boxes. But if you want it to look pretty, find one that's already done. Unless that's just a way that you like to spend your free time, go for it. Um, the best tools, I think, are the easiest. Google Docs, Google Slides, Microsoft Word, PowerPoint. 
those would all be super simple if you were creating your own. Um, if you are doing searches, those are probably the platforms you're going to find them already created in, which makes it easy to create and easy to share with your students. Okay, so our last one that we're going to talk about kind of summarizes um, everything else. And actually in our book, this is the chapter we start with, um, but we wanted to finish with it today. A lot of um, us, when we had to transition during COVID, transition from an in-person situation to a virtual or digital classroom situation. And we did it on such a fly that we didn't think through that digital classroom routines are just as important as in-person classroom routines and that we actually have to explicitly teach them. And it doesn't matter if we're teaching kindergartners or if we're teaching 45 year olds, we still have to go through what those classroom routines are. Um, so, so making sure that we establish norms and what it looks like regardless of the environment is really important. Um, and part of digital classroom routines is talking about digital citizenship. So we want to make sure that our learners are good citizens, whether it's in a digital environment or in an in-person environment. And there's so much um, that has been produced and developed and reiterated on over the last, gosh, 20 years for digital citizenship that the resources out there are really good and really powerful. So you don't have to feel like you have to recreate those. But I do wanna highlight what all um, digital citizenship includes. And if you go to digsit.us um, or ISTE also has um, their digital citizenship standards, you'll find this huge umbrella and not to be overwhelmed by that, but to think about how the, each one of those naturally integrates into what you're teaching and when you're teaching it. So some things that digital citizenship includes is using technology to make your community better, engaging respectfully online with people who have different beliefs than you. Sometimes I think adults need more of that um, <laughs> teaching than children when you go on social media and look at some posts. Um, using technology to make your voice heard by public leaders, and, um, and shape public policy, and then determining the validity of online sources of information. That last one is one of the most important ones also for learners of all ages, that we don't just see something that somebody posts and take it as um, a valid resource. So teaching learners of all ages how to find um, the validity of online sources of information. So that was a quick highlight of digital citizenship. Um, when I think of that, I think of the three words, safety, security, and efficiency. And that goes not just with digital citizenship, but just with those digital classroom routines. And one of the easiest ways to manage that is by using your learning management system. So a lot of schools have something adopted, either Google Classroom, um, Canvas, Schoology. Those are some of the big ones out there. And by using that learning management system, it helps you as the um, instructor to be clear and consistent with those routines. If my learners are coming in and they know the first thing that they do either in an in-person class or a virtual class is that they log into the learning management system, they will then find whatever the first thing is for that class period, either a bell ringer or an opening activity. Um, but that consistency is important to get them engaged immediately with the learning that's going to happen that day. Um, using vetted resources for digital citizenship. If you're going to be teaching explicit lessons, that's really important. And I would go directly to Common Sense Media for that. Um, be Internet Awesome is a really good one if you are instructing elementary teachers because that one is designed for K to five learners. Um, it's like a video game that teaches digital citizenship. But Common Sense Media is one where you can, again, do a search for just about any type of digital lesson that you would like to. Um, provide and the resources and the lesson is there for you. So again, in that learning management system though, is where you're going to set up and establish those routines to make it an easy one-stop shop for your learners. And then we talked about norms. Um, these are just some of the digital classroom routine norms that um, I've, I've helped elementary and secondary teachers develop. The secondary one is actually one that I use when I'm working with adult learners as well. So it's just something to kind of state at the beginning of our time together, we're going to be present, we're going to listen actively, we're going to collaborate with ideas, take risks, be honest and kind, be critical, don't criticize. Um, when I have a new group that I'm going to be working with um, ongoing, I prefer to have them help me create those norms at the beginning, because then again, they have an increased um, ownership in what's going on. And then you also can make sure everybody understands what those mean at the very beginning. 
So um, I know one that, that we've talked about before is be, com be comfortable being uncomfortable. And that makes a great norm because then you can discuss what that looks like and sounds like in your classroom as well. But the importance of these images is just to make sure that we have those norms and what that looks like um, in whole class settings, in small group settings. Um, I know somebody had put in there uh, in the chat earlier about collaborative learning. We couldn't agree more about the power of collaborative learning between the three of us, but norms for small collaborative groups are different than whole class norms. So making sure we take time to establish those routines as well. So we have a protocol um, that we really like using too with, again, learners of all ages. And this is also a protocol that's in our book. So we're going to use another favorite tool, which is Padlet. And the quick protocol is I used to think and now I think. So I used to think this about instruction or about digital integration. And now I think this. Um, Shannon threw the Padlet link into the chat if you're not following along in the slide deck. And so if you're not familiar with Padlet, you're just going to click on the little plus button underneath each column, and then you'll be able to type. Um, you can feel free to video record your response. Um, you can add pictures that demonstrate. There's so many different integrations within Padlet. Feel free to be as creative or not as you want to on a Friday morning. We understand it may just be typing and that's okay too. And then Shannon, did you set the settings for, um, con yes, she did. So feel free also, once people type in theirs, you can add comments and interact with other um, Padlet entries. And you can also click the little heart if you really like somebody's as well. So take a few minutes to go ahead and reflect briefly on everything we just shared. Yeah, Padlet is only for three for three of the Padlet boards. Um, it, and then if you want to use premium Padlet, it's $10 a month. Um, however, if you use your three Padlets um, and you know you've, they've served its purpose, you're more than welcome to delete a Padlet or delete a few of the Padlets and keep reusing them as many times as you want, uh, as long as there's only three housed there. And you, yes, thank you, Jamie. And do they still, they used to give you additional free boards for referrals. So if you refer it with, to students, there's a referral link under your settings in your Padlet account. And if you would give it to your students and they sign, sign in, then it used to be like for every five people that signed up, you got an additional board. Um, I haven't checked into that recently, but it's a way to get some extras. And you can take a screenshot, but you can also download it as an image um, directly from Padlet too and then clear it, clear all posts after you download as an image. Okay, one more way to integrate tech that um, also looks at our social emotional well-being. There are a million of these, I shouldn't say million, that's, that's a little bit ex of an exaggeration, but there are lots of these um, scales out there that are super fun. And um, I, I'm a huge Office fan, so there's one on a scale of Jim Helper. There's also on a scale of Michael, Scott. Um, this one's on a scale of Kat. How are you feeling about integrating technology right now? So if you will just pick the number that shows how you're feeling about integrating technology. And listen, number one might be how I feel about it being Friday, but about technology, I'm feeling more like maybe number six. So throw in how you're feeling about integrating tech into the chat. And if you want to just do the number, just do the number. If you want to add some commentary, we're happy to, um, to have extra context as well. And if you're super involved in that Padlet, feel free to keep working in there too. Jamie, great question as everybody's throwing those in. I'm kind of laughing about number seven and eight and love that people are super honest about it all. Um, in our book, I, I think what you'll find is that it's super applicable. There's so much um, access in there and like the steps that Shannon and Matt provided for how to do some of the, um, like how to set up a jigsaw and how to set up a web quest, that's included in all of our strategies in that book. We wanted to make something that a teacher could take and immediately do in the classroom without having to go and research how to do it. So tons of access. Um, and we even have some QR codes that are going to be linked to some screencasts and um, different links in there. So I think you'll find it very user-friendly. 
it's it's not so much about the user friendly it's about the students issue with access so okay. are you are you providing that differentiation in there uh, because we have smartphone users and the adult ed we have chromebooks yes so all of our stuff is device agnostic that we talk about in there um, we also, I'm pretty sure you guys can correct me if I'm thinking wrong, but I'm pretty sure everything is free that we talk about also. Um, if, it, if it's a paid for version, we highlight that or talk about it too, but I'm pretty sure everything's a free version. Um, we also, and I know this isn't what you meant by access, Jamie, but we do have a whole section on accessibility too for um, yeah. students that are different, differently able. And since you brought that up, um, we will go ahead and say, um, our book is supposed to be released sometime this summer. It's still in the final editing stages. And if you want to stay um, up to date on where we are in that process and when it'll be released, if you follow any of us on Twitter, we're going to make sure that we keep that up there um, and current as well. There was also a question in the chat um, from Laura about the difference between HyperDocs and WebQuests. Um, and she, you know, she mentioned that many of the WebQuests are out there feel outdated. Um, you know, I, I agree with you. I think, you know, it does require quite a bit of, of searching. As far as hyperdocs go, um, you know, it's it's a very similar concept. Uh, I know the like founders of hyperdocs.co, which I just put in the chat. Um, you know, they they give you a variety of different hyperdocs. They have a ton of resources there. Um, but really the goal is inquiry, right? And they approach it from the five E's. Um, and so they, you know, many of them do at least. And so it's broken down and kind of guides students through that cycle of inquiry. Um, it's a very similar concept with WebQuest. I use HyperDocs more so, um, oftentimes I'll use WebQuest for like the preloading of information, right? The investigation prior to getting into unit um, or a lesson maybe that they're not familiar with. Oftentimes I'll use HyperDocs throughout the course of a, of a lesson. So that, that inquiry piece like throughout a lesson um, for me, it seems to, to be more effective, right? We'll go through the engage and then the explain, uh, all of, all of the five E's uh, or six E's, one of the two, sorry. Um, and then throwing it back, I often end my hyperdocs with choice boards at the end so that they can create their products. And the great thing about hyperdocs, if you're not familiar, um, hyperdocs are just documents or you can use slide decks. Um, where there is a variety, like a guidance of steps that, that students walk through and the resources are linked all on one uh, seamless page and students respond there as well. Um, Matt, Janelle, do you guys want to add? I'm going to share my screen real quick. Um, yep. Now, keep in mind, this is an example that a third grade teacher made, but it, it really is a, an example of how what a hyperdoc could look like for anybody. And this was a teacher that happened to use, um, they were studying ecosystems. She let her students decide which ecosystem they wanted to research. And then she put them into groups of three. But this is what her hyperdoc looked like. She did not create the, the design or the format. She found one that was already done, took out their um, information, put in her content. So the purpose of the lesson, um, I don't really call this a rubric, but some assessment guidelines she has at the top. And then she has this, so each group had their own copy of it. So students were typing directly into this, which made it easier for her to manage. So they had to type which ecosystem they were learning about. Um, they had, these are their norms. Um, so she calls them group computer jobs. It was really their collaborative, um, oh, they had roles for each person in there. And this just reminded them what their jobs were. So then they had to self-select who was going to be the leader, designer, writer. These are those group norms that we were talking about, and it just was a link to a presentation to remind them what those were supposed to be like. And as a team, they had to type down which three they were going to use in order to work um, positively in a team. And then she had this overarching question, and then they had to write a hypothesis, come up with three more guiding questions about their ecosystem to guide their research. Um, and then down here, she gave them all these different websites that they could do or use to find um, information because those were valid. And then here's that choice board um, that Shannon was talking about. They got to choose how they were going to present their information about their ecosystem to the rest of the class. And they could choose Google Slide, um, Sway, Adobe Spark, Poplet, Google Sites, a poster, or if they had a different idea, go tell the teacher. 
And then the other thing that I like the most on here is she had a reflection at the end where the kids had to evaluate themselves as a team member and the other people in their team because she wanted it to be um, reflective of how they worked in a collaborative group. So that's a quick example of a hyperdoc. Um, it can be that extensive or it can be much shorter. I will give you access to that project. Um, it's a teacher, I'm just going to give her credit for it. So it's a teacher, a third grade teacher in uh, Pflugerville, Texas that created it. And I'm gonna share with you a view only um, version. So if you wanna use it, just make a copy of it and then you can edit it as much as you like. Any other questions? I um, answered a couple in the chat. Let me do say this real quick to Matt. If you go to that hyperdocs.co website that Shannon said, there are tons of, of lessons Hyperdocs already created that you can search by subject area and grade level. And they also have templates there as well already created. Thanks so much for joining us. If you don't have more questions, then um, fill out the evaluation that was mentioned at the beginning um, by Anthony. Make sure you do that. So a couple of people have asked us about like, how can we stay apprised on the book um, and all of that stuff? Um, you know, we are primarily social media users and we're aware that some people don't use that. And we're in the kind of in those, that phase of like getting our newsletter, uh, you know, get getting it going and such. And so what I've done is I've created a quick uh, Google form. I'm gonna pop it in the chat. It's simply just your name and your email. And once we have more information about release date and everything, we'll, if you fill that out, We'll go ahead and add you to our email list um, to notify you of where you can get the book um, and, and such. But we just want to say how grateful we are for you giving uh, your time today and allowing us to share with you some of the things that we're passionate about. Um, we are excited to see a group of awesome educators, those supporting students and adult learners like in the room, um, willing to give up time to you know enhance their own toolboxes. So we're so grateful for you. We can't do what we do without you. Um, and if you have any questions at all, please, please, please don't hesitate um, to reach out to any of us.